All right, I want to talk about a deal that I, I did this year. I just I wrapped it up sometime around the uh, first week of August, something like that. So you can see the address, 331 Jefferson Avenue in Bristol. This is a, a unique kind of deal, but a great deal that I made a bunch of money off of. I want to share it with you so you kind of wrap, around, wrap your brain around how this works, OK? So this, this deal is a short sale. And then I also combined it with a lease option. I, I just happened to put up a sign near this guy's house, and he called me. And I started talking to him, and I said, what's going on? Why are you selling the house? What's the problem with the house? He said, well, my wife uh, will no longer live in the home. That was his biggest problem. He had some kind of, like, male order wife. Uh, and uh, I met her. She was a very attractive lady. This man is not a very attractive man who called me. He's a cool guy. I like him. But um, his wife wouldn't live with in the house anymore because the place was, half of it was like still under construction. So um, he also said that he worked in, in Harrisburg. So I think he had some kind of P uh, Pennsylvania government job. And there were some really weird things about his house. Like there was something like, something like, 10 different laptops all over the house, right? And they were all plugged in, like, to these Ethernet cords. It just looked like something weird was going on. Guy from the government, what the heck's he doing with 10 computers? All right, something's going on there, right? Anyway, so I go to look at the house. He's got a permit from the borough of Bristol right on the front window that says he's got a permit to do construction to his house. It's dated 2012. <laughs> so... Right? So I met him in like 2019. So uh, he had saws, he had all kinds of materials all over the house, but the guy obviously did not have the skills required to get the house done. Um, for those of you who've been uh, members of the school for a while, Vera just happened to be with me the day I went to meet this guy. And uh, so some of you probably remember Vera. He hasn't been here for a while. And um, anyway, he's with me, so I'm sitting down, I'm talking to the seller. And he's selling the house because of his wife refuses to live there, and he wants to live with his wife. And um, it's too far of a ride to work. So I started talking to him about possibly taking over his mortgage, all right? But he owed like 150 grand on it, and his house just wasn't worth it. First of all, it's Bristol. So that area, you know, you got to get in cheap there. If you're going to make some money, you got to get in real cheap to buy a house there. I cannot pay 150 grand for this house when I know that the highest comps were like maybe just over 200 grand, right? And this house needs a lot of work. So there's no way I could buy it as a subject to, which most of our students know about, except for some of you newbies, where we love to take over someone else's payments and just make those payments, right? So whenever, this guy was also behind in his mortgage. So <coughs> he was struggling to make the payments. He didn't have enough money to fix up his house, nor did he have the skills to fix up his house, but he was behind in his payments. And whenever you hear someone say they're behind in their payments, I want you to just think of this. <coughs> All right, I want a bell to go off in your head. And you go, Phil Falcone, he told me when they're behind in their payments, I should suggest a short sale. That's all you got to remember, OK? If they're behind in their payments, you want to talk about a short sale. So what is a short sale? Let's get into it. So after talking to the guy, I figured out the short sale was the only choice I really had, because I'm not paying 150 grand for this house. So what I did was I, I talked to him, and I explained to the seller that there are some benefits to doing a short sale, OK? So the way it basically works is the bank is going to accept less than 150 grand, all right? The bank's going to accept less than 150 grand, and they're going to give a little bit of moving money to the seller. That's all they're going to give them. Maybe the but moving money, what, what does that mean? Well, if he's going to rent an apartment at two grand a month, maybe he'll get first, last, and one month security. So maybe he'll get six grand. Seller in this situation, he's losing this house. It's on its way to sheriff sale. He's going to lose the house. 
right? So what I want to do is I want to be the guy who's going to buy his house, and I'm also going to negotiate the short sale, all right? So I'm pretty much doing the bulk of the work here, sort of. You'll see in a minute how I do this. So the first step to, you know, the whole, the whole benefit to all of this is the seller's just going to get some moving expenses. Now, he's not thrilled about the fact that he's going to lose this house that he's been living in for a long time. But at least he's getting some money in his pocket, and he can go to Harrisburg and find an apartment or something else and do whatever he wants to do. Okay? The benefit to me is I get the house real cheap, hopefully. You never really know in a short sale what the bank is going to lower the price to. You just don't know until you go through the exercise, all right? And if I could get it cheap, well, then I could do a lot of things with it. I could wholesale it. I could flip it. I could do whatever I want with it. So let's get into it. This is a picture of the actual house, you know? If you drive, if you happen to be down there, it's like just a couple blocks away from the Delaware River. Pretty cute area. It's like a historic area. A lot of these sidewalks. What's, uh, what's that bumping noise I'm hearing? Somebody tap dancing on a microphone? Is that you? Not now. <laughs> All right. Okay. So in this neighborhood, it's a cute neighborhood, a lot of old houses. They got like wrought iron railing fences outside. They got beautiful brick sidewalks. They got um, the Delaware River just a couple blocks away. You know, there's a boat drop there and whatever you want to do. All right, so first thing I did is I'm going to get this house under contract, all right? So in order for me to even do a short sale, I've got to lock up this house. That's what I tell you. That's what all of you should be doing, right? When you're calling sellers, you're booking appointments. When you're on that appointment, you got one thing to do, Robin. What Lock is it? it? Up. Lock it up. You, you, didn't, you didn't even need a microphone. You <laughs> talked so loud there. That was good. You got to lock it up. Your job on the phone is to get an appointment. Your job on that appointment is to get a contract signed. That's your job. All right. So I brought in my, I basically got this house under contract during my initial visit with Vera. All right. And what I told the seller is, I said, look, I'm just going to buy it for some ridiculously low price. And he's like, why? And I said, because it's going to be like a year of negotiating with the bank. I have no idea what the bank's willing to take. But I know he owed 150 grand. So it gives me somewhere to start. That's on me. Go ahead. Hold I was just about to hit him when you Hold stopped that me. Yeah, but that's not me. Did you lock this house up before you began the short sale absolutely process? absolutely you get out the contract and you lock up the house if you left your contract at home you get a napkin and you write it on the napkin and you get the guy to sign it I one time opened up a pack a, a pack of cigarettes you know and when you open up the cardboard part on the outside it actually gives you enough room to write a contract <laughs> write the contract you don't leave without it okay so he says well well, how do you know what, what price the bank's going to take? I said, I don't. That's why we're going to put a ridiculous number on it right now. I think I put like 65 grand on it or something, right? You know, he was like nervous about it. I go, look, don't worry about it. They're not going to accept 65 grand. And, and, and th that, that's like, you know, a quarter of, of uh, what he owed on it or whatever. It's n nowhere near it. So the point was just lock it up, okay? So... I had a couple of options here. I brought in a construction guy. A construction guy looked at it, and he goes, well, we should really open up this house. It's kind of an old house, so it had a lot of choppy rooms, right? Nobody likes that today. Everybody wants to walk in the front door, and they want to be able to see right through to the backyard, right? And that means you got to put in a bunch of header beams and take out all these walls and everything. So we figured it was going to cost about 80 grand to do that, right? And there's just no way, like, first of all, I don't even, at this point, I don't even know what price I'm getting the house for. So I can't commit to spending 80 grand. We looked at it and said, what if we just left the rooms the way it was and we made it look as nice as we could? We figured about 50 grand. So at this point, I'm not even sure I'm even going to be able to make any money with this house because until I know what the bank's going to sell it to me for, I'm really clueless. All right? I just don't have the information that I need to get from the bank. All right? So we started talking about it and we said, maybe, just maybe, the best thing to do with this house is to get it <coughs> for as cheap as we can, 
and just turn around and sell it without fixing anything. If you see a lot of the properties that I put up for sale, that I blast out to my list, for those of you who, who aren't familiar with my list, it's called addictedtorealestate.com. And if you just search that, addictedtorealestate.com, you'll see my list. No one else uses that name. And uh, I love to put up properties that are wasted. You know, I look for, I look for garbage. I look for the ugliest houses on the planet. And then I try to buy those properties cheap, and then maybe one of you might want to come in and fix it up and sell it and make a spread off of it. I'm okay with that. I get a wholesale fee. I'm happy. All right? So my first initial thought was that this might be the kind of house that I buy, and I don't do anything to it. All right? Even if the only... Th so there's always a benefit to somebody. If I don't fix anything, there are certain real estate agents, for one, that will go, oh, my God, how could you dare <laughs> list this house at this price, right? Find somebody who's looking for a cheap house, somebody young maybe, somebody who has a little bit of skills. Those people will love this kind of property. So that was, I already kind of knew that if that was what I was going to do with it, Having a cheap house is always a solution, regardless of what it needs. All right? There's always somebody that's willing to do it. This is a picture of the backyard. It's got a really long backyard. It's got a shed way in the back. This property, actually, if anyone's familiar with Bristol, this property is on Jefferson Avenue, but it runs all the way to the next block. It's a really long property. It's a twin, so there's a neighbor attached to him, but it's a big house, four stories. Okay. So I got the contract, we signed the agreement of sale, I got the house under contract, okay? And I'm using my wholesale contract, which is what I use almost all the time. I don't have a specific contract for every kind of real estate deal. I just keep it simple. Just grab the wholesale contract that I use. It should be on the website. If it isn't, yell at Larry, because Larry likes his wholesale contract. But I'm going to let you in on a little secret. Mine's better. Okay. So the next thing you do when you, when you get a house under contract is normally I want to take a bunch of pictures and show you how beautiful this house is. But this house isn't beautiful at all, right? And I got to get the bank to lower the price, right? So I went around and took pictures of every ugly thing I could find in this house. It was only about 50 pictures, okay? Mate, you, you, I didn't go around and mess up the house, but that's not completely out of the realm of reality. You could put a blue tarp on the roof and say the roof leaks. I don't do that kind of stuff usually, although I may have, I may have, I may have done it a couple times in my life. I really don't have a great memory, so I'm not sure. Um, but you do what you got to do to make money in this business. We all, we all got to eat. When you're an entrepreneur, I can't look up and go, boss, can you help me? There ain't a boss, right? So I have to figure out what needs to be done. So you take pictures of all the ugly stuff in the house. And when you're arguing with the bank, you're going to send them all those pictures. And you're going to say, look at this. Did you see this cracked sidewalk? Did you see this worn down deck? Did you see this? Did you see that? Did you see this? It's got aluminum siding. They stopped selling that stuff in like 1971, <laughs> right? You just you make arguments, as many arguments as you can, OK? So I'm going to hire a professional short sales negotiator to deal with all of the people in this transaction. I'm going to explain that in a minute. So let the process begin. That's where you got to start. First thing you got to do is get the property under contract, right? Then you're going to hire a short sale negotiator. I'm going to show you my short sale negotiator on this presentation. And any one of you can use them, and they do a wonderful job. Just don't mention my name. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. My name is, is Gold there. They love me. I got like uh, all these files there of properties I'm working on. Okay. But, but what's going to really happen in this process is all along, through the whole process, you're going to be trying to convince everybody involved in it to convince the bank to give you a great price. Okay, so let's keep going. There, this is my uh, short sale negotiator. It's called the Short Sales Cooperative. Their slogan is lawyers, realtors, mortgage banks. I don't know about you guys. I don't really like any of those three categories. But um, 
they have all these people there, and all they do is negotiate short sales. That's all that they do. Okay? So think of them almost like uh, a maestro in an orchestra. You are going to have to do very little. They're going to, and they do all their communication, which I really like, via email. So what they do is anyone who needs to be notified about whatever steps are going on, they shoot you an email. So you get a bunch of emails that you may or may not understand. One of them might say something like, we submitted your agreement of sale to the bank. The bank has yet, respond, has yet to respond. We ex we'll call the bank next Wednesday if they haven't responded. And this kind of stuff just keeps dribbling in every day. You're not getting 10 emails a day, but you'll get three a week. And that's how they keep everybody in the loop. And I actually really like that system because the seller gets copied on these emails. The realtor gets copied on the emails. The buyer gets copied on the email. So everybody knows. And I don't have to keep calling these people or getting phone calls from them saying, what's going on with the shirt sale? You know, you got copied on the emails, just read them. Right? So that's basically what they do that makes my life easier. So we have a number of people involved in this transaction. OK, so see if you can follow this. The short sale negotiator has been hired by me. I am the guy who got the contract signed by the seller. But when I signed that contract, I did not make myself the buyer. I bought it in a trust. And I got a business partner of mine to be the actual buyer. So why did I do that? Because I am a licensed real estate agent. So I'm going to take the position of the realtor in this transaction. I'm going to be the realtor. reason I want to be the realtor is because many of the people in this process are going to call the realtor. So I want to make sure. I'm the most experienced guy at it. So I want to make sure that the calls go through me. And then I'm going to you know, know what to say, depending on what they're asking me. Could be the appraiser. It could be the short sales cooperative just calling me. It could be the seller calling me. It could even be the buyer, but he's sort of my business partner, right? So he doesn't have a lot of questions for me. He knows exactly what I'm doing. Those phone calls come in. I'm going to handle that position. So I'm making my business partner the buyer. It sounds complicated. It's not. It's super easy. If you use a trust, you can simply make the trustee be somebody that you trust. Who said that? All right, good. The trustee is nothing but somebody that you trust. You could be the trustee, your wife could be the trustee, your friend could be the trustee, just somebody you trust, right? Because if you make somebody the trustee, they could actually sell your house. So make sure that you're, you trust them. Make sure you trust them, okay? So my business partner is now going to be the buyer on a trust agreement. He's going to be the trustee, right? And the bank is going to get beat up now. So the short sale, and who, who cries for a bank here? Is there anybody here crying for a bank? Nobody? Anybody here like banks? OK. This is fun. I mean, if you can beat the heck out of a bank, you, and you're going to make a bunch of money, this is like fun. All right? We're going to have a good time. So what happens over the course, shortest one I've ever done was three months. Longest one I've ever done was a year and three months. It all depends on the bank. Craziest thing about it, out of the realtor, the seller, the bank, and the buyer, and the short sale negotiator, the person who's losing money here is the bank. It's always the bank. Every day goes by that the bank is not getting paid on the loan. The bank is getting hurt, right? They are the only party of the five who has everything wrapped into this deal, and they need this thing to happen quickly. Yet, ask me who is the entity that screws up and slows down every single one of these. It's always a bank. Don't ask me why. I can't figure it out for the life of me. Like, if I was on the other end of the phone, and I worked at the bank, and I had the authority, I'd pick up the phone and go, what's your offer? What? 79? Let's make it 89. Right? Be done. Get off the phone and wrap it up. That's what entrepreneurs would do, but banks have their process. 
which is ridiculous, and it takes forever. All right. So the seller's getting nothing but his moving money. The bank's going to take a haircut. The short sales cooperative, that's my negotiator, they're going to get 1%. That's all they want. It's not much, right? So as a realtor, I'm picking up uh, a 3% commission, a 2.5% commission. I've got to give them one point. I'm fine with that. The, the, the short sales cooperative doesn't know that I'm actually the buyer, too. Right? I'm in with the buyer. The buyer and me are the same. I'm part of the trust. But they don't know that. Okay? But then again, they probably do. Because I'm doing enough of these deals with them, and just, they're not stupid. They know what I'm doing, but they want my business. I'm s I sent them about 12 short sales in the last year, so they want the business. So they tolerate me doing what I got to do. So do you and the uh, short sale cooperative both sign the tr uh, trust or just a No, they're not owners. They work for me. I hired them. So your name doesn't show up on the trust? Not. Okay, so most people don't even know what the heck a trust is. Okay. All right, so if I made you the trustee of my trust, right, because I trust you and I do trust you. Mm -hmm. I don't know if Ralph you trusts should. you, but I trust you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, all right. People would look at that who don't know any better and aren't used to looking at trust, and they would immediately think that Robin is the owner. Mm -hmm. So if you list yourself as a trustee, people go, oh, you're the owner. You're the trustee. Trust, trust as people think about them, are maybe they think like your parents are worth $100 million and they left you this trust. And, oh, my God, Phil Falcone is the trustee. Little did they know, it's a piece of paper I filled out about five minutes before I sent it to the short sales cooperative. Okay, it's all part of the... The real estate game that we play here. Yes, Ed? Uh, you said that you have used like SSC um, like 12 times in the past year. Is this a route that you would recommend doing for majority of the properties? I think my mic, never mind. Um, <coughs> would, would you do that for the majority of houses you're trying to buy from a distressed seller? Or Maybe. I'm starting to lose interest in them because if a bank is willing to work with you and they're using common sense, I'm cool with working with them. But a lot of these banks just have crazy numbers. They just throw crazy numbers on the property. Like, for example, during the 2020, all of the short sales I was doing, right, <clears throat> they couldn't walk into a vacant house because COVID might be inside the house, <laughs> right? I got this house in Jenkintown. It's got structural damage. I got the freaking sheriff from Jenkintown Borough calling me up going, Mr. Falcone, you said you were going to buy this house. When are you going to buy it? I said, oh, uh, we can buy it when the bank gives me a price that makes sense. I'm still negotiating it. This thing's going on forever, right? It also, the house also has frozen pipes over the winter, and they burst in who knows how many places. The only way to figure that out is to go into the house and turn the water on. And now we're talking about, you know, waterworks here, right? <coughs> and some of those leaks are going to be behind the wall. So now I'm busting walls open to find the leaks. Yes, Andrew? Uh, for the 1% commission, is that <coughs> like do you pay them first and then they get the 1% commission? No, they get or? paid at settlement. Okay. I just pay them on the HUD at so the end. So they work and then, and then they get paid. They do all the work they and do. they don't get paid until the end. What and if they only get paid if I buy the house. Okay. Right? So if it doesn't sell, if I walk away from it, they got to find a whole new buyer, a new realtor, get a new. They got to start the whole process over again. Again, another reason why banks should move swiftly, but yet they don't. And when these deals blow up, they're like they're like freaking two, three years into some of these things. It's ridiculous. All right, let's keep going. <coughs> All right. So this particular short sale for Bristol, it got approved. Miracles happen. I'm watching the 76ers, and I get an email, and it says the price is 76. I said, okay, I'm cool with that. That's now look, roughly half of what the guy owed, right? So now the question is, what the heck am I going to do with it, right? So before I tell you what I'm going to do with it, it comes with a deed restriction. So a deed restriction is almost like a lien on the house, right? The bank sold me this house for half of what they owed. So they're pissed. Are they pissed at me? I'm not the guy who didn't pay them. 
<clears throat> in fact, I'm the guy who's saving their ass. If they would have negotiated and worked with me quicker, this deal would have been long done by now. But instead, they have to go through their, their complex process and their massive corporation with so many different departments, they don't even know who to call to get things done. All right? So they put this deed restriction on me. So what is it? The deed restriction means I cannot sell the house for 90 days. Now, for those of you who know me, you think that's going to stop me? <laughs> <All right. laughs> I, I did a presentation on the website. It's called uh, The Mindset of an Entrepreneur. All right? And it's all about, like, if you're going to do what we do for a living, you need to learn and start thinking. Somebody put a fence in front of me. How am I getting? Am I going through the fence? Am I going over the fence? Am I lighting the fence on fire? What am I doing with it? I guarantee you I'm getting past it. All right? These kind of things don't scare me. This is just part of the mindset that entrepreneurs have to have. If, if, if you go to school, you go to college, you get a job, you work for a corporation, there's structure, there's rules. If you are going to be an entrepreneur, you better untrain all of that garbage because that doesn't fly in this world. <clears throat> what gets done in this world is getting shit done. Make it happen. All right? That's what you got to do. <clears throat> all right. So what I did is I'm definitely going to buy this house. So I'm actually, this is not going to be a wholesale deal where I'm just getting a contract and selling it to somebody else. No, I'm actually putting up the money. Me and my business partner, we put up the $76,000 to buy the house. Now we own it, right? We officially own it, but the deed restrictions still exist. So I don't know, we bought it like whatever it was, March 15th, and we had to wait 90 days, so it brought us like, was it, what's that, July, April, May, June, whatever, June 15th, right? Um... I don't know if any of you were here the night the kid who bought it from me came here to the school. Jamie, weren't you here when that happened? Yeah. You remember that kid? All right, his name's Jimmy. He was a young guy buying his first house. His girlfriend's buying it with him. And their, her father and Jimmy's father were construction guys, even though they didn't know each other. So the two dads, and Jimmy and his girl, Started fixing up the house right away. I'll get into that in a second. So what I did is I listed the house for sale on the MLS. I put it up for 129000 right? I got a bunch of phone calls. I got a realtor to offer me 130000 However, what you got to understand about this is that I have been working on this deal already at this point. Once I paid the 76000 of my money and my business partner's money. We had already been working on this deal for a year. Now, I was happy about the 76000 I knew I was going to be able to make money off of it. But, what I, but I also got this stupid 90-day deed restriction. So why did the bank do that to me? It wasn't the bank. It was the bank. No, because, yeah. because I had deals like that, too. But like Use a mic, will you? If I, if I had a buck for every time I told you that, I'd have a extra you, you'd hundred be rich. dollars. You'd be rich. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, uh, the VA or... Um, it wasn't uh, a VA Fanny, loan. The bank did Fanny, it. Fannie Mae. I'll tell you why they do it. They, they you know, they, they put 90 days. But, you know, they don't know whether you did or not, but... Well, anyway. I'm just saying... They do it because they don't want me wholesaling it, all right? They don't want me turning around and flipping the contract two days later. All right. Okay. All right. So that's why they do it. All right. I wasn't exactly worried about it, but I got an easy way to get around it anyway, which is I did a lease option with Jimmy. So this kid Jimmy wants to buy the house. I had a realtor on the phone. These were her words as best as I remember them. She said, my client loves this house. My client really wants this house. I said, good. Here's what I want. I want $15,000 down in non-refundable option consideration. I'm going to sell you an option to buy the house after the 90 days is over, okay? So just, just imagine this. Here's the transaction. Jimmy gives me $15,000. It could be a check. It could be a bank check. It could be cash, whatever. Jimmy's giving me $15,000. I'm going to agree to sell Jimmy the house for... Whatever price we agreed to, in this case, it was $123,000. But he cannot buy it 
until the day after the 90-day deed restriction. Get it? As a as an extra bonus for him doing that for me, giving me 15 grand. So why do I want the 15 grand so bad? First of all, I love getting chunky money. I love my chunky money, okay? But the biggest reason was it's non-refundable. So is Jimmy gonna give me 15 grand and then not buy the house? Let's just use Larry's phrase. It's highly unlikely, okay? <laughs> highly unlikely indeed, right? So. This realtor saying, my client, my, this house is perfect for my client. My client wants it. I said, fine, give me 15 grand down. She goes, no way I'm going to do that. I said, stop talking for the seller. Meet me at a Dunkin' Donuts. This is during COVID. I can't even meet them anywhere, right? I got to, like, stand out in my car in the rain to have a business meeting. I said, put me together with your seller, and I'm going to talk to them, and I'm going to make them feel more comfortable with it. Uh, she goes, nope, nope. She didn't want to, realtors are terrified of letting you talk to their clients. Yeah. Right? Like she was going to explain the lease option, the way that I do it. No way. No freaking way. And I said, just, do you want to make the commission on this? You want to get your client the house she desperately wants? Let me talk to her, damn it. Right? But she was too worried that I would steal her clients. You know what I did? I sold the damn house to Jimmy, who gave me $15,000 cash. I know I got a locked up guy. And even if Jimmy didn't buy the house, I get to keep his 15 grand, and you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do it again. <laughs> I'm going to do another lease option and get somebody else to give me 15 grand, even though I don't want to waste the time, okay? So these are the kind of things you can do if you have a real estate license. You can use the MLS to help you find buyers that will do the deal for you, all right? So the lease option is how I get around the restrictions. And the mindset of the entrepreneur is how you figure these things out, all right? So we call it NROC. The money that Jimmy gave me, we call it NROC. It stands for Non-Refundable Option Consideration. I'm giving him an actual contract that says I'm going to sell him this house for $123,000, but only if he gives me $15,000 down. He's buying the option. If he exercises the option, which he did, he bought the house for 123 grand, the 15 grand that he gave me comes off the sales price, right? So I'm not screwing him, I'm just locking him into the deal to make sure that he doesn't play any games with me. Because I'm already waiting a year for this house, I'm not, w and then another 90 days, I'm not waiting more. I want my money, I like my chunky money. Right? Okay. So this is how I made out on a deal. I sold it to Jimmy for $123,000. Now, I was the realtor on the short sale. So I got paid a commission to be the realtor on the short sale. Right? My business partner, whose name is Shane, he's the trustee of the trust. So again, now I'm the realtor. Now I put the house back up for sale again. I just bought it yesterday. I put it right back up for sale again. Jimmy did not have a real estate agent. So I was Jimmy's agent as well. So I was working the front and the back and the back of the short sale. I got paid another $6,100 in commissions for being the agent on my deal. Yes? Conflict of interest? Uh, I am a, you I'm a walking conflict of interest. <laughs> you got to go back and watch the mindset of the entrepreneur. <laughs> Aren't they separate uh, transactions? What's that? Yeah, there's there two separate no, transactions. No In one transaction, my business partner bought the house from the bank. I wasn't even a party to that, or at least they don't think so. And now this time around, I'm a party to it, but it's on the trust, and my business partner's name is the trustee. Nobody ever even looked. They, people, if I created a trust for you, the trustee's name you would see. You would not see who the beneficiaries are. The beneficiaries are the owners. The trustee is just the person you trust. Okay? So now it's a whole new transaction. So we bought the house for 76000 We sold the house for $123,000. We made $47,000 in profit plus the commissions, $53,000.
And this is a house that I do a lick of work to it. I did put up bandit signs and got the guy to call me and I went to his house and I did sales presentation with him and I had to do a couple of them. I had to do a couple of them because he was a little bit, he was a little bit concerned. He had never heard of a short sale, that kind of thing. Um, all of these things, uh, incidentally, the bank never paid him the moving money. All right? But the whole thing about it was that the short sales cooperative um, somehow dropped the ball on that. Uh, I told him, the seller, you need to ask the short sales cooperative to get you to move in money, and somewhere along the line that fell apart. But So this is a deal where I never fixed anything on the house. I mean, I went there probably like seven, eight times over the course of like a year and a half that this thing was going on, right? It, when Jimmy bought it, I let him go in and start working on it before he even owned it. So during those 90 days, he was fixing up the house. And I did pop in, and I made sure he left the key in the lockbox there so I could pop in and make sure he's fixing up my house. Because how the hell do I know if he's, he's taking out a bearing wall and going to knock my whole house down, right? So there's some risk there. But uh, it all worked out great. Fifty-something thousand dollars, fifty-three thousand dollars for a house. I never fixed anything. I did put up seventy-six thousand, but I got back all my money when I when I uh, well, yeah when I sold it. So this is the kind of thing. I just get your brain thinking about things that we can do in this amazing business. It's just like playing Monopoly. You get the <laughs> dice, you chuck them, and then you don't have to have it all figured out. Then you just start going, geez, what could I do? What could I do? Let's try to lease option it, because I want to, because I was getting tired. I'm working on a thing for a, a year and a quarter. I want to get paid. I want my chunky money. All right. Were you paying all the holding costs on this property the whole time? What holding costs? I didn't own it for the entire year. That the short so seller the house just, was just sitting. The there? seller owned it. Who was taking it on the chin? Oh, so the seller. Who? The bank was. was taking it on the seller chin. Seller wasn't taking it on the chin. Even he, the property tax. He never paid. No, when people go delinquent and they're just, when the house, you know, nothing. if they're not paying the mortgage, okay. they're not cutting the grass, they're not paying nothing, right? Right? He might be paying the water bill or something just so he could take a shower. <laughs> All right, last question, Ed. So with that, um, even though you're not due for any of the, the holding costs, <laughs> the none of the delinquent, like, taxes or anything come through as, like, a lien or anything when you're trying to get that closed? No, all that stuff gets wiped when the short sale is completed. Otherwise, I would have never bought it. Oh, man, that's sweet. <laughs> okay? That's sweet. Right? And the holding costs for the house only started after I bought it with the 76000 and we bought it with cash. So we didn't have a mortgage. Right? So we just, when the taxes, when the house got sold to Jimmy... Whatever we owed got squared up at that point, all right? All right, I hope you, I hope you guys learned something, and I'm out of here. <laughs>